Hey everybody, Adam Dakin, Managing Director of DreamIt Health Tech. Delighted to be joined by David Quirin Guntla, CEO of GraphWorks. Uh, as you can see, we're counting down, waiting for some of your friends and colleagues to arrive. We're delighted you're here. Uh, we are going to get started in just a couple of minutes. David and I may talk a little bit and then we'll formally kick off once the timer hits zero. Um, so David, as you and I were just discussing, I actually do have a little bit of background in dialysis That's access, great. having started a company that was developing a device uh, for vascular access. So I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the problem, but you might elaborate a little bit on kind of what is the issue? What are the challenges? If you're a dialysis patient, why does your access even matter? Sure. I think, you know, just from an access standpoint, you know, it's what keeps you alive, right? It literally is your only way to stay alive. And I think that's what's so important for these patients. And I think the problem you're trying to solve, I think, from an from a access connector standpoint is so interesting because they only have so many spots they can put these, these graphs or fistulas or these conduits, these artificial conduits, or utilizing a vein as an artificial conduit to create a way for dialysis to be done. There's only so many spots to do it. And if you run out, this patient's really, you know, it's a, can very often be a conveyor belt to, to, to their demise. And that's not a good spot to be in. And I think that's, there's a lot of innovation uh, that can happen in the space. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. This, I don't think most people appreciate the scope of the problem. It's, uh, I th we'll talk a little bit more sure. about it when we get into it, but it's sort of an underserved patient population really that I think is maybe a little harsh to say, but gets ignored um, by the clinical community of focus on more interesting problems and, and diseases. Absolutely. I think one of the things that always surprises people kind of on our pitch deck is when we talk about the dialysis is 1% of the Medicare population, but 8% of all Medicare costs. And I think that's outsized number, if you will, is, uh, is pretty shocking to, to, to a lot of people just in general that we spend that much of just the, our annual health care budget in the U.S. on, on this problem and, uh, alone, and I think that's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, we may touch on this again, but in 2016, Medicare spent $113 billion yep. on that's kidney care. That's crazy. Which yeah. I think, unless you have somebody in your family, like everybody knows somebody with cancer, right? right? So we all appreciate the scope of that problem. Right. But I'm not sure everybody knows somebody who has a kidney problem right. or is undergoing dialysis. And I, I think the, the worst part is, is that, especially in the way I think dialysis is done today, it so often means that they're not a part of society anymore, right? And, and, and so it, often, unfortunately, and not, not that they're not trying to be, but because of the way that dialysis is done, they've got to spend a few days a week kind of sequestered in a dialysis center. Going through that process and procedure, it might not mean you know, the ability to go through their everyday life that they otherwise and their job and family life that they otherwise Yeah, no, that's actually, that's actually a great point. The, the whole process of being, going through dialysis almost alienates you. Right, and it's the, really sad. Yeah, really yeah, unfortunate. Yeah, it is. It's high depression rates, incredibly high suicide rates. Right. I mean, you know, one of the last places you ever want to end, uh, end up is in a dialysis right. chair, right? I mean, Absolutely. it's got so many, just the quality of life is, is abysmal. Right. So, uh, okay. Great. Uh, all right. I think we're going to officially kick off. Uh, really delighted to welcome David Karen Guntla, CEO, founder of GraphWorks. I'm Adam Dakin, managing director uh, of DreamIt Health Ventures. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining and also for your patience. We did get started a little bit later than usual. David got caught. Uh, compliments to the, our friends at the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> Indeed. You, you got caught in a little yes, bit of the traffic we jam. We did. They, were, they shut the whole thing down for about an hour, so that was kind of nice. So that was good. Okay. That was good. Uh, and then even, even the last mile wasn't easy, apparently. Got stuck in the elevator, too. So we're doing well. So we're doing well. Proving your entrepreneurial exactly. skills and navigating around uh, pit, Fight the you know, fires minefields and, and, exactly. and pitfalls uh, in order to... <laughs> so look, we're, we're excited. Um, so what I'd like to do is start with you kind of giving a brief overview on your background, sure. kind of a high-level overview of the company as well. Uh, and then we'll jump into it. We got a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, want to remind everybody watching that it'd be great. Post your questions in the comments box below. Uh, we're going to talk for 30, 40 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll jump into answering your questions. So uh, David, thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. Oh, I should also mention, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that you guys were a fall 2016 yep. Dream It, proud Dream It Indeed. Um, alumni company. Uh, we're actually an investor oh, yeah. in yes. GraphWorks. 
Um, so with that, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll talk a little bit about an overview of the company. Sure, absolutely. So I think for me, uh, I started off by uh, coming out of college with an undergrad in biochemistry. Uh, spent several years doing research at the National Institutes of Health uh, down in Baltimore. Really thought I was going to head that direction, but uh, realized that I really wanted to spend more time with people and being able to, to really merge science and people together and decided to, to head off to medical school. Uh, so I had a chance to go to medical school and was going off to a surgical residency program with the idea of doing uh, vascular surgery when really got confronted with a problem that Graphics is trying to solve firsthand. And I think that's always a, a great place to start with the problem and seeing what the that disintermediation between the patient and the physician and what that would mean for the future. Awesome. So decided not to go through medical school, I gather. I, I went through all four years of medical oh, school did. and I was about to start residency and then I, and then I told my very Indian parents I was gonna take a year off. And uh, yeah. I, I assume that went well? That, that went well, that went well. No, they, they've been great. They've been super supportive uh, the whole way through and uh, six years later, we're still doing graph work, so. Yeah, there, it is, it's amazing how many health tech entrepreneurs either got their medical degrees but then never practiced. I started out as a pre-med. Sure. I didn't last nearly as long as you. <laughs> I got through my first chemistry test, uh, and then I switched. Um, actually transferred into the business school right. after my freshman year, but uh, always had you know, fascination with medical technology. Um, so give us a little bit of an overview of the company, the, the tech, the platform, and the problem you're solving. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, like I mentioned, we started off with the patient problem. And the realization for me was doing seeing a lot of vascular procedures that we put very expensive uh, implants into patients and we wave goodbye, they walk out the door, and we knew that they're gonna come, we knew that they were gonna come back. And we know where there was a question of whether it was days, weeks, months, uh, but something was gonna happen. And the fact that their disease process was still ongoing and we had put a kind of a temporary solve on the, on the problem, I kind of started asking, well, what are we doing to, to look at this? And the answer was, well, we monitor these patients, but we have to bring them in for expensive imaging or some other procedures maybe once a year. And that means we miss stuff. So kind of the question was, is that just a sampling error problem? And most of the clinicians that, that we talked to said, yeah, it's a sampling error problem. And how do you solve a sampling error problem, in my mind, was with, with sensors and software. So Graphworks actually started off, I teamed up with my co-founder, uh, Samit Gupta, who was on the back of a previous exit, exited a company in the wound care space to, to Johnson & Johnson. And so we were uh, teamed up right after I was kind of coming out of med school, and he was on the back of that previous exit. We started to, to work together um, on this idea of smart implantables, actually, which is where the company started. And then we actually made a pivot uh, in 2016 16, just before we came to, to dream it and realized that the value of what we had already built as a platform, an end-to-end -end platform connecting the patient and the physician on the inside of the body could also be done from the outside of the body with the wearable. And a lot of that initial market uh, idea came from some of the folks in the dialysis space that we had been working with um, on both the implantable side and the wearable side. And we stuck with the wearable because we realized it was a, a quicker path to market, if you will, and a better way to establish us as a platform utilizing the same uh, building blocks that we'd already built uh, for the first few years. Got it. So in a minute, I want to talk about why you decided to focus initially your go-to-market, why you picked sort of this dialysis sure. space as a place to start. But even before that, um, what I find really fascinating about the business that you're in, um, you sort of sit at this junction of medical device company, wearable, data platform, precision medicine. So there are a lot of value propositions and a sure. lot of stakeholders when I start. So, so how, do you, how do you characterize your, your company when you think about all those different sort of stakeholders and, you know, and, and areas that you, that you touch? I think what's interesting a lot uh, about medicine is, you know, who's your customer, who's your user? I think those are, those are different people. Um, and I think when it comes to who are your investors, I think you've, we've actually had to look at uh, merging um, from, from a little bit of those different viewpoints and those value props and explaining why as we develop what value prop we're gonna hit first and what maybe what value prop we're gonna hit second, but why that's on the continuum of a very focused uh, pipeline that we're, we're developing. Um, so when you think of the company, do you, and you're either pitching investors, are you, precision medicine company? Or are you a medical device company? I think we talk a lot about, we're, we are focused on Try not to get in any of those boxes? Yeah, I don't know if we, we try not to get maybe pigeonholed too much. I think we really focus on 
We are a remote patient monitoring company delivering clinically actionable hemodynamic parameters. And I think what that does is it talks about what we do from a remote patient monitoring standpoint and the fact that the thing that we actually sell, if you will, is around the data that is actionable, something that it fits into a clinical workflow and allows a clinician to impact a patient's life. That's what we do. We don't, we're not giving you wellness data. We're not giving you wearable data about how a patient is doing. We're not selling necessarily to an insurance provider about here's the patient's doing good things about themselves. And I think there's a really good market for that, but we're really focused on this piece of information will help a clinician decide whether to go down this pathway or this pathway. And that's what's going to really differentiate us um, as a provider. So that I think also makes it, we're less tied to the, uh, the hardware um, than we are to, to more of what we're doing in the future. Yeah, I mean, when we talked previously, you made an interesting comment, which, you know, I, I think you're alluding to the fact that when people hear wearable, they have a certain connotation, mm -hmm. right? Like, I immediately go to a Fitbit. Right. right? I hear wearable, right. I think Fitbit, right? And the clinical utility of that information, I guess, is still not, not crystal clear. Um, so you're clearly not like you said, it's not the diagnostic lifestyle kind of information. You're trying to provide real clinically actionable data. Um, so, you know, thinking a little bit about, um, well, you know, actually I want to back, I want to, I don't think most people appreciate, we talked sure. about this, I don't think most people are the scope of the problem you're sure. fixing. Because maybe they're like, oh, this is kind of a niche problem, great, you know, we're going to measure some blood and some dialysis patients, not a big deal. Can you scope the problem? Because I don't think a lot of people, everybody knows cancer, but not everybody sure. knows somebody who has like end-stage renal disease or is undergoing dialysis. Right. Just, just the size of the, the, the problem. Sure. So I think if you look at um, folks that are on end-stage renal disease, that's the end of the continuum of folks that have kidney disease. Kidney disease is a very large problem worldwide, but even just the folks that are at the end stage represents about two and a half million people worldwide. In the U.S., it's about 1% of the Medicare population, but 8% of our cost. I think, like you mentioned, we're spending over $100 billion a year. That's amazing. Even over $100, $100 billion, billion just on this problem. On this problem. Alone. And what's interesting is for this patient population, your kidneys stop, effectively stop working. This is often a cause of things like diabetes. Um, high blood pressure kind of leads towards this, this issue. And if the kidneys stop working, you need to have something else to do the work of the kidneys for you. And the kidneys are a lot more involved, I think, than people realize. Uh, they're involved in your, your blood pressure. They're involved in how much you know, red blood cells you make to keep yourself oxygenated. They also obviously help manage your fluid volume. And if your fluid volume is too high, you end up with heart failure. And that's the two big problems that these patients face, is that in order to have an external machine do the function of the kidneys, they have to typically have an artificial conduit. It's typically placed in the arm. They have needles placed into that, one to pull it out into basically a big washing machine and to push it back in. And you have to keep that alive. So about 20% of these patients are gonna have a problem with that access in any given year. And about 40% of these patients, because we're not doing the right amount of dialysis at the right time, are hospitalized, 40% of these patients in any given year. That in and of itself, just right. to the payers, is over almost a $20 billion problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an enormous problem. It's sort of a, an enormous problem that I think most people in health tech don't, don't appreciate or understand the size, the skies of the, of the scope of it. And because it's such a huge problem, it's actually a place where new payment models, right. the government is really testing. Right. It's like I heard the, the head of CMS a few years ago said, like, dialysis is like the first place we should go to test right. new payment models. Exactly. And I assume that probably informs how you're thinking about your value proposition Right. And the stakeholder network, right? Capitation is going to be a big factor in how we take care of these patients. Um, moving away from sort of this episodic capitation, which I think most people are familiar with. Right. I'm going in for a bypass. Okay, here's your money hospital. Here's $40,000. Do a bypass. You know, if you make a profit, great. If not, that's on the provider, right? But what I think is happening in dialysis care, which is really interesting, is true sort of end-to-end -end capitation. Right. Indeed. Take care of the patient completely. Here's the money, but you have to take care of all their healthcare needs. So I think it's it's kind of interesting to watch how those models evolve because it's going to affect the rest of healthcare. Right. I think a few years ago we saw that capitation and bundling kind of come into the orthopedic market, and people were talking a lot about it. What I don't know if a lot of people realize is the first market to become kind of really fully single payer, if you will, was dialysis right, because in the uh, 70s. Because right. it, you have to, it's not just about a treatment modality, it's about treating this entire chronic condition and 
the sequelae that come from it. But what happened in the 70s, which was really interesting, is now if you have dialysis, the government's paying. There's exactly. no other disease no state, other, right. right? If you have dialysis, right. the government will end up paying for it. Right. You. Everybody, if you have ESRD, you immediately become Medicare eligible. Your private payer is paying a little bit for the maybe. If you have private pay, they will pay for about, I think, the first 30 uh, some odd months, if you will, and that's it. So it really does become a big Medicare and I think public health problem that we have to tackle. So let's shift gears and talk sure. a little bit about your go-to-market strategy. There's a lot, I mean, this, you've got a true platform technology here. Um, that you've got the device, and I'm not sure, do we actually yeah, show sure. uh, the audience the yeah, device? So, I, I don't think we, we have, so yeah. it's, it's a wearable. Um, here, uh, the patch comes actually ensconced uh, around an Amazon Alexa-like hub. So there's about uh, a few of these around uh, this hub. It's pure plug and play for the patient. So we did a worldwide deal uh, with Vodafone. So it's pure plug and play. So there's no setups. So they go home, they hand them a box. There's a, there's a few of these around this hub. They plug it in. It's connected to the cloud immediately. They pull one of these out. There's a little applicator here, realizing that dialysis patients, off, you know, you've got a place with one hand. They peel off the back end. They stick it on, push it down, and it's now on and taking data. Good to go. And so what's neat about that is I think it's made it really easy from a usability standpoint. Uh, we've trained patients five minutes in our, you know, at our site, send them home, it's up and running, and we get really great data without uh, needing to, to train them and, and burden the clini clinical staff and the technical staff because we realized that was going to be someone who was working with the patient a lot. Got it. That's no, really helpful and very clever. So your platform could have been deployed in a lot of other places, congestive sure. heart failure, peripheral artery disease, right? All places where what you're doing, one could make a pretty compelling argument that there's a clinical need for this data which would impact patient care, right? But you've, you've nicely scoped out the size of the dialysis opportunity, but why go there first? So I think there was a, a few reasons. One was the acuity of the patient problem. Uh, it was one that we had seen and, and we had been approached uh, actually by some of the different players in the dialysis space for when they heard about uh, some of our technology and its capabilities. Uh, and we really liked it uh, for, the, for that was one of the reasons. Um, because the patient feedback was so meaningful. I think for these patients, when we put this on them, they talk about it, they say, someone's finally giving me some control. It's a power. Like someone actually cares about me. I'm not just on a conveyor belt of this loop of get an access, have it fail, have a heart failure problem, get hospitalized. I now somebody's actually trying to take care of me, and I think that was really meaningful to us. I think number two was also the fact that we realized if you go into some of these other markets like congestive heart failure, peripheral, vascular, you have to have a very large sales force that is very focused on clinician. The sales cycle there, while maybe per perhaps quicker is very focused on the individual sale. And that was, requires, I think, when you see a lot of those companies, they, they suddenly have to have a 100-person yeah, sales force, of deploy it, and raise a lot of capital. Whereas we realize dialysis, you can go get 5, 25, 250,000 patients with a single enterprise sales contract, and you're going to build into it, and it's going to take time. But there was an opportunity to do so, which uh, also really helped us out. And I think lastly was actually the, tech, the technical feedback. If you think about congestive heart failure, like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a fluid problem. So what better population to work with than a dialysis patient population that has such massive fluid swings? And if you're going to go into peripheral disease where you're waiting for a blockage of a, of a vessel to develop, why not once again work with a patient population that is prone to having a high rate of failure to set up your value prop as you then go into those markets as people already have those validation and proof points? Perfect segue to talk about the value prop, actually, which was sort of next up on my sure. on my list of questions here. So what is, when you define that value prop, touching lots of different stakeholders, because as we know, dialysis patient care is complicated. There are many people involved in it. You have the dialysis clinic themselves. You have a nephrologist that's typically following the patients. You have an interventionalist who may be trying to help maintain. You have a vascular surgeon who probably created the access in the first right. place. So you've got this interesting group of clinicians who need to collaborate on the care. Um, so who do you, are you pitch, who are, who's the value prop to and what is it? Yeah, so I think you know, one of the things that uh, is a challenge in the market is what you just mentioned. There's so many disparate players all involved in, in one patient. We actually looked at that and flipped it on its head and said, for what we want to do in the pipeline, that means a lot of people are going to hear about what we're doing as we go. The vascular surgeon means we have an access to PAD in right. the future. Um, the, the heart failure doc and nephrologist are going to hear about fluid management. So that's one thing that we actually kind of was a 
could have been difficult, we, we, thought, we felt like we turned into a positive. But I think when it comes to the value prop, we really focus something on the four Ps that we talk a lot about internally as a company. The patient, the physician, the provider, and the payer. If their incentives are not aligned, we feel like there's, you're not gonna get any traction. And even though the value prop is obviously, you know, for the patients is, this is gonna give you control of your life back and you're going to reduce your mor morbidity and mortality risk. For the physician, it's your patient's not gonna have these problems and you're gonna be able to control what happens with your patient. For the uh, provider, it's actually talking about new revenue. What's the reason that you as a dialysis provider are losing revenue or you have such thin margins anyway? What is your problem? And a big problem they had is, you know, that they had done it internally as a study was these patients having one of these two problems means they end up in a hospital, means they lose a tremendous amount of revenue, which means they're, they're struggling. They're always, you know, trying to fight back and see what they can do to, to keep the patient there, and, which is the best thing for the patient. And then obviously for the payer, they're stuck with that hospital stay, they're stuck with that surgical revision, they're stuck with that cost. And I think there was a lot of alignment, and like you mentioned about the payer models too, of capitation and Medicare Advantage being very uh, prominent within the dialysis space and looking, people are looking to have that transition, we found to be very advantageous of the alignment of, of, of the incentives. Yeah, I think we spoke about this previously. So to the dialysis clinics, this idea that you're losing revenue, right, because if a patient's sick, they're not in the clinic, and they're, they're still predominantly in a fee-for-service model, right? There's a reimbursement per dialysis session. So for them, they're, they're very much of a fee-for-service mentality. Right. But some of the other stakeholders you just mentioned were moving towards capitation. That's much more value-based. So right. I think it's really important. I think a lot of companies don't get when they're putting together their go-to-market strategies even at the enterprise healthcare system level, I'm selling to a value-based healthcare system, the Geisingers, the Inner Mountains, right. that have their own plans and half of their patients are on that plan. That is a different value proposition than most academic medical centers, you know, the Absolutely. Penn Medicine, the Jeffersons. The reality is we talk a lot about value-based models, but those centers are still mostly fee-for-service, right? right? So you have to tell your value prop and your story has to be different when you're talking to those different stakeholders. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And I think it's about who do you want to go to market with first, right? I think um, one of the things that we really focus on is from that payment side, right? And, and help that drive, not just we have clinicians excited about it that want to work with it, but actually, okay, who are the folks that are already inside of a payment model, whether that's the National Health Service in the UK, kind of as a single pair value-based uh, Pro, you know, a value-based sale that we could talk about, or in the even in the U.S., who's looking at these patients um, as a Medicare Advantage or capitated uh, segment that we can enter in? Then who are the clinicians involved in that? Because you can get a lot of folks excited about new technology, new techniques, but you have to think about how does this actually help me make a sale in the future? I think is important. Yeah, I mean, you made the comment earlier, which I think is really important, is right, is that the user isn't always the buyer, right? Um, and I think a lot of companies don't always make that connection right. and think about that. The four P's is really a nice um, way to describe it. I, I was a marketing major. We always had the three P's, the, the four P's, payer, provider, patient, physician. I think that's really a good, a good way to think of it. Um, so how do you, with, with those sort of value props in mind, you know, one of the things, one of the big challenges for any startup, digital health startup, even in, even in the med tech, how do you prove that ROI? Absolutely. Right? Because you know, after hi, how are you? The next question is, what, how do you demonstrate your ROI? Yeah, I think you, um, you have to be clinically validated. And I think that's really important. I think we talked about that, that transition from wearables. I think the world is going to go to what is my clinically actionable step. I think that's happening. Um, we're excited to be a part of it. Uh, I think where you really find um, some value, and what we looked at was kind of three phases. One was clinical validation. Why we liked dialysis was there was a international guidelines for certain metrics that have to be monitored by patients. And CMS mandates that these providers and payers monitor these patients already. So there's already tools and techniques. Those techniques are either invasive or infrequently utilized or expensive. So we already knew there was something we could compare ourselves to a gold standard to show that clinical validation. So when we walked in the door, we could say, we're not just 
bunch of smoke and mirrors, Silicon Valley. No, here's the actual data showcasing as compared to what you use today. Here's our metrics as well. Here's the data. Here's the doc that we did it with that you know already that has a, a good pedigree that you can be familiar with. I think that was phase one. Phase two then kind of came into how do we show that HCNR or health economics and reimbursement ROI. And so even as we went from just validating the metrics to then doing longer term studies where we start to showcase things like, for example, a recent patient, uh, these patients are typically on um, drugs that stimulate their red blood cell production. And it's very expensive, epigen. It's also the same drug that Lance Armstrong was on a long time ago, right? But it's pretty expensive. And not all of them can afford to, right. to pay a lot of money, right? It's kind of three or $400 injection. And some of these folks are on a three or four times a week. We had a patient who was on it four times a week. We saw kind of where his, uh, his hemoglobin was. We actually saw a spike. He had a confirmatory blood draw that actually confirmed this, the same spike that, that we saw and that they actually titrated his dose to three times a week. So just within one month, by catching it early, that's $1,500 worth of savings just right then and there that we were able to showcase. So I think that's the phase that we're in now. And then I think phase three, when you kind of sell the future a little bit, as I'm, I'm sure that you did kind of from you know, the sales and marketing side a little bit, was, okay, we're really gonna help you titrate dialysis for your patient, and here's how we're going to get there because of what we're measuring today. So I think the clinical strategy also really fit in well with the, the go-to-market and initial use case and validation strategy as well. And you made a comment, I think, that was interesting when we were speaking previously uh, I mean, clinical validation, I do think a lot of companies don't take that seriously enough on the front end. The robust clinical trials, key, what, what are the clinical endpoints, getting statistical right. significance, running a robust, really rigorous clinical trial. Um, a lot of companies, I think they're like, well, this is so intuitive, it's so obvious, it makes sense. We should monitor these patients, of course we right. should. It's, right. How are we not monitoring dialysis patients? Right. It just makes sense, but it doesn't just make sense. You have to prove the outcomes, but you had a couple comments that were interesting, I think. One, the ROI is over time, right? And a lot of times, we show up in an enterprise healthcare system, they're about, well, what's the ROI right away? But it's not necessarily a six month or a 12 month ROI, right? Like we're talking about patients where that ROI may accrue downstream, right? Is that is that a challenge for you? It's definitely a challenge. It certainly is a challenge for startup, I think. Uh, one of the, the, the struggles that we really were encountered with was some of these folks wanted, you know, a very expensive clinical study to, to work with. And, and, you know, I think sometimes clinical can be a little bit of a, unfortunately, can be a pay-to-play pay world. Uh, and it's also your opportunity to showcase your, your value to your potential customer. But at the same time, what we, what we kind of turned that on its head was, how do we get our potential customers to actually finance that actual clinical study because they believe in it so much already that we can then go to the investors and say, here's customers, they believe in what we're doing, that they're willing to put some skin in the game to offset a half a million or one and a half million dollars right. worth that's, of that's cost. That's a lot of validation. There's a lot if, of validation if, already. If my customers but you have to have that clinical willing. validation first, right? And you have to, I think, also join them on a journey. I mean, a lot of them were, okay, you have three or four metrics today what does your pipeline look like? And so we could go and work with them. For example, I think there's a, a video with the NHS that, that we uh, will be releasing on YouTube that talks about the work that we're doing with them. That's actually focused on hyperkalemia, which is a big uh, a potassium imbalance for these patients, which often leads to an ER visit. And so even though that's not, it's something that was on our pipeline, when we actually talked about, okay, here's what we can show you today. We can kind of sell them what's in the bag of, of monitoring the access and monitoring fluid, but we knew that that's somewhere we wanted to go. There's a real mutual appreciation for the science and for the patient that allowed us to talk about a shared journey. And I think that's important for, for a startup to find is, is find the clinician that's not just you know, or the exciting brand name, or the you know whatever it might be, but find somebody who's on, who's incentivized to go on a journey with you, and is incentivized to get data, share data, work with you to make your product better and your process better. And understands at the same time that you might have some hiccups, that you might have to to right. revise something a little bit, and that it's going to be okay, and you're going to work to right. To, you to need share champions future. earlier right. on that share you your really vision and, and see where where it can go, and who aren't just beating you up over. Show right. me your ROI right, right. now. Like, right. how much money can you save me tomorrow? Right. And I think it's, it, it, it's, it's attractive to go after the big flashy names to put on your deck. I'm going to get investors that way. I think um, what's, what we've heard, I think, on the investment trail too, uh, you know, the fundraising trail, if you will, is more of, you know, start, help me, walk me through that data. What's the next step? What are you doing? And I think that being able to showcase that, that strategy is, is key. 
Yeah, I mean, we try to encourage companies not to logo hunt, right? right. Yep. Because that can be a long, painful, expensive Indeed. process. Indeed. The sales cycles can be really long when you're going after the large providers. Um, you know, my partner Steve Barsh uses the fishing analogy. Um, great, great dream at Dose on this, uh, where he talks about like, do you want to go fishing in the ocean? Take your boat out for eight hours right. to try to catch the big tuna, which right. you may or may not catch. Or do you want to go fishing in the bay where you know you're going to right. catch some fish and it's right. going to take a lot less time and money exactly. to catch those fish? And as a startup, you only have so much fuel, right, to, to go get, catch that's that right. tuna as well. That's a good so, point. Your right. boat's going to run out of fuel. Boat's going to run out of fuel. Then you're going right. and right. stay out there forever. Um, and I think, you know, I always like to say, like, I'd much rather have, like, you know, three or four St. Mary's of the Babbling Brook that love my product, even if the revenue isn't, you know, isn't huge, but I got real customers who use it and love it. Right. Right. That's what investors right. want to see. They can figure out the rest. Like they can, you know, kind of interpolate right. where this is going to go. But you better have some customers early on right. that share your vision, that love it and use it. And the question is your price point, too. Right. In terms of reimbursement, I think, you know, in terms of new um, payment modalities, a lot of subscription, you know, I think we'll see a lot more subscription service and, and kind of, you know, per patient per month. Uh, there's a lot of those questions, right? Especially in chronic disease management right. as opposed to episodic disease management. You hear about the, you know, the PMPM, -PM, and I think a, a question that then comes into mind is, okay, if my price point for a very large user base, if I go to my biggest customer first and set that as a price point, is that something that I lose leverage on in the future? Because everyone else will probably want it to. And, and you see that in negotiations of preferred pricing and, and other things. Right. And whereas, all right, if you find the the other customer, they're willing to understand that, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna, you, you might get right. preferred pricing, but we're not going to give that to everybody else in the, in the future. And at the end of the day, you got to be able to, to keep fishing, to stay alive, and to keep to, right. to be able to go get, get the bigger tuna. Yeah, you're going to starve. Right. Um, I, got an, I, I thought on, on this same topic, I got a really interesting email yesterday talking about ROI and the fact that I think what we're saying is, you know, ROI is important. You have to be able to quantify the impact, the goal but it's usually not the mission of what you're trying to do. And I thought this was an interesting email from, from the CEO of a company um, that, that he had sent out this email because he was letting investors know that a key customer, they had just lost a very key customer. And what he wrote was, key learnings include importance of budget cycle alignment and focus not just on ROI, but also on strategic business goals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really, really key. I mean, I think in terms of if, you know, you might have a doc that's really excited and they're going to be at that facility or they're going to be, you know, you're going to have a, uh, maybe a technical champion inside of a strategic partner. They're going to be at that company for a while. But your BD partner or your, you know, that, that kind of business unit leader, they might be cycling out, out of there in two to three years and they've got year one, they're fishing year two, they're trying to get something done. Year three, they might be moving on to something something else, and then you're stuck, right? So really trying to figure out where you are in that cycle uh, and whether or not you're a fit with what that business unit leader needs or whether you're a fit with the business unit or with the hospital system that's trying to profile a value-based system or trying to profile a chronic, a chronic kidney uh, disease standpoint or a chronic care disease you know, mission that they have. Are you aligned with the organization's missions or just somebody's uh, mission? I think it's something that's really key to figure out. And we, we've all learned that lesson, I think, the hard way. Yeah, it's <laughs> a very it's, insightful comment yeah. because what I didn't tell you, but what, what you picked up yeah. on and what was actually embedded in that email was what happened was somebody left. Yep. A key person in the organization left, and they were all about ROI, ROI, and all of a sudden the key person left, and now the business goal alignment left when that person right. walked out the door, and they lost the account. Right. So, yeah, I thought it was really an interesting, sort of an interesting observation. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Talk about funding. Sure. You've done a great job funding, raising just shy of 16 million so far. Um, in a space that's not necessarily the easiest one to raise nope. capital in. Um, so kudos and congratulations. That is a yeoman's effort. Never easy to raise no, capital. A great, no we have a great team. We have an amazing team, and I think they, they really do an amazing job. It's a, everyone's pulling hard on the yoke to, to get it done. So Yeah, so congratulations on that. I know you're now out for another round of financing. Yeah. Um, so for this next round, even for the pat, maybe what you learned from the past rounds, but since you sort of sit at this junction of device, data platform like we talked about, um, you know, precision medicine. 
So which investors do you target? Do you target go to traditional med tech investors? Do you go to digital health investors? You actually didn't go to any of that. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and very intentionally, I think, you know, we wanted to, um, I think in a lot of ways, the, the venture capital road can be very enticing. There's a, there's a time and a place for it, absolutely. Um, at the same time, understanding that, you know, where is your market and is your market mature and, and what are people looking for? I think it's just as important. I think if you're getting into, um, you know, if you're taking what Omada and Lavongo have done in, in kind of managing chronic diabetes and you say, okay, I'm going to manage chronic hypertension, you may be able to find those same investors because those, those models are, are very similar. But if you're trying to build a hardware as a service business, that's a completely different, different question. What are you going to do? Um, and I think if you go, if you look at, uh, we've, we've had you know, very traditional um, tech VCs on Sand Hill Road who like us, love what we do, have known us for a long time, but they're like, our LPs will not touch you until there's an FDA clearance uh, you know, of right. this product, right? And you're just like, well, you'd be awesome to, to have, we, we like it, but it, there it is. We've also had traditional med tech VCs who've been much more about, okay, it's not a therapeutic, Right, so you're kind of a diagnostic. So right. you're even, you're, it's even right. harder. Right, that's an even. Yeah, it's, now, it's the even, bar is now the bar is even higher. And then the question comes into, okay, what's your 12 month data? And it's like, well, you know, here, here's where we're at right now. We've got, yes, we have 165 patients worth of data, something like that now. And you know, here's what we've showcased, and here's what we're doing. But you know, we're going to go past. You know, the idea is dialysis is an amazing, you know, off ramp on the highway. But we might, you know, really leverage that data platform past this, and that's probably not a traditional med tech uh, way of looking at the world. And I, I think there's there's nothing wrong with that. I think there, there's been a really good playbook there um, that that people have hit a lot of singles and doubles, and uh, to really to really uh, build uh, really amazing products and, and, and companies. But I think there's also you know other folks out there that are willing to work with you, um, that are thinking about data platforms, that are thinking about materials, that are thinking about what do wearables five years from now look like. It's not all gonna be watch-based or rich, you know, kind of risk-based, if you will. I think there's gonna be a, a different proliferation. And so I think finding folks that are thinking about that market the way that you are ends up being really meaningful. So we're kind of heading into that world uh, right now, uh, moving along and, and, and moving through due diligence with, with quite a few folks, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then I think on the, on the flip side of that, what we've done to date though, is we really focus on angel investors. We were excited to have Dreamit be a part of our uh, investment round as well, but it was very, very intentional. And even there, we have very traditional med tech folks that have done devices. And then we have, uh, you know, some of our uh, Salman and I's friends from Facebook, Google, Apple, that are, uh, have put a lot, you know, quite a lot into the company as well. And they, they're very different, you know, there are very different viewpoints and expectations and, and thoughts about how companies are built and, and, and work through. And I think you have managing that and thinking through that is, is always a challenge, but also an, an exciting opportunity. Yeah, I mean, we are, I think, from the days when I was raising money for the companies that I started in a different place now, because there, there's this perceived convergence of digital health with devices. But I don't think the investor community has synthesized that convergence right. yet because when you go out there, I'm a med tech investor. I understand selling a, a, a regulated device. I understand reimbursement and I understand that you're gonna sell that big building over there called a hospital right. or an enterprise healthcare right. system. And then I think there's, um, some funds obviously have both, but then a lot of funds are more traditional software, SaaS businesses. Right. So they're not really thinking about it as a healthcare investor. They're like, oh, this is an enterprise SaaS business that sells to healthcare. Right. I know that business really well, but I don't know anything about devices. So, you know, I'm not investing in a device platform. I think it really makes it hard for a lot of companies now that are at that convergence to find the sweet spot of investors who, one, obviously you always want investors who can add value so right. they can help you on your journey, add insight yeah. and networks. But two, to understand the business enough to get excited Right. To really appreciate the you know the tremendous return that they can right. get by being on the cutting edge of where you know skate to where the puck's going to be right? right and I think a lot of investors um, are, don't don't have that vision at least sure. that was my experience because you want people want to put you in a box and I, and I think you know there, like I said there's a good reason for that but at the same time like you said skate I think as a company and as a CEO you're skating where the puck's going to be and being able to help you know really excite people to join you on that realizing that might be a little bit tougher uh, and requires some faith and patience i think is always a the tough task of a ceo but a worthwhile one at the end of the day so yep all right i'm going to switch gears again we're going to run out of time soon and there's still there's so much more i want <laughs> sure. to talk about we're going to run out of time but 
I do want you to, it's really interesting when we talked about your regulatory strategy sure. and how you built that around not just getting your existing platform approved, but anticipating where the, where skating to where the puck is going right. to be and actually building that into your regulatory strategy. Right. So elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. So when we kind of looked at, uh, we, we, we talk a lot about building backwards. So, you know, kind of my, my COO, my co-founder and I, we spent a lot of time, we build backwards. Where do we want to be in 10 years? Where do we want to be five years? What does it take to get there? And if we looked at um, from a regulatory standpoint and from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, what were the big costs and the cost drivers, those are the two. And also manufacturing ended up being a, a big cost driver because of the, the need that every time you change your hardware platform, if you have to bring up a whole new line, there goes a million, two million dollars every single time. You have a massive amount of working capital if you don't sell through right. it. We looked at our, um, and we looked at our rounds uh, and we were gonna need, just to kind of get to cash flow break even, you'd need almost $10 million in working capital. So we said, okay, that's, we kind of set that problem aside and we said, okay, well, you can always raise that money. There's, there's debt finance, there's things you could do, but okay, but that seems like a lot. How do we tackle that problem? And the other question was from a regulatory side was, okay, if we go and clear a product and or start selling it, and then in the background, we're giving a slightly new product that was investigational to the same set of folks, but not getting paid for it, and then bringing, trying to bring a, get that product cleared and then bring something else, we're, there's a massive lag of a year, two years between each product iteration. Once again, you're losing a lot of money. You're spending a lot of money in R&D. How do you do this differently? And we actually looked at both of them and we said, okay, if we actually get our hardware platform up to the level that we want it to be, we can actually kind of, you, you have to hit design freeze anyway. Let's hit design freeze as a hardware, get that platform up and running, offset the need to set up a new line each time, get that out there, but then make everything else a software update and basically utilize our um, kind of a registry, if you will, in market as a way to then bring some new, new metrics into place. And that way you're delivering the same product to people, whether it's investi you're using it for investigational to, to compare and do it as an FDA submission or what you're actually handing out there uh, as a product. And that really helped us offset and solve both problems because we were able to find a, a contract manufacturing partner that said, okay, we believe in what you're doing. We see the pipeline that you have. We want to get involved and help you do that. But yes, we agree. We don't want to be stuck building a new line every six months, one yeah. year. That's going to suck up a lot of dollars. Here's how we can help you. So we're actually able to pull out that entire working capital need out of the raise yeah, to huge. stay, you know, to take $10 million out of it, stay really, really lean once again. And at the same time, the benefit is, yes, it's a little bit more pain now, but that hardware platform, uh, it gets cleared as a wearable. You need a usability study and showcasing both bench and, and, and human data as validation. Once again, we talked about then you get you get to really speed up after yeah, really that. Really smart. So I think and the flywheel keeps itself going, which right. is nice. That's uh, almost in a way a hack that, that you figured out, and you know, for any startup, figuring out a way to take ten million dollars out of the uh, you know out of the capital requirement right. is is huge. Right. And on, so. and on top of that, I think time to exit as well too, because it's always a question from your investors, right? And I think being able to then say, look. Everything that we're doing, new indications, whether that's things like blood pressure or something else down the line that we're already working on, those are just going to be you know, indications rather than a whole new cycle, which means we can open up new markets and new opportunities pretty quickly, which, which helps the, the exit timer in everybody's head sure. shorten up a little bit too, which everybody's yeah. working against. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I have lots more questions, but sure. I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, put them in the comments uh, box below. Uh, it's great. We have a ton of good questions coming in here. We're never going to be able to get to all these, but it's awesome. Um, we'll maybe try to address some of these offline sure. um, on our LinkedIn page uh, since we won't be able to get to, uh, to get to all of them. So I think we'll move over to the questions now. And the first question, uh, when you were fundraising, were investors concerned about, we just talked about regulatory. Right. That's why it's the first question. Uh, were they concerned about the regulatory risk? So I think everybody always is. I mean, I think, you know, like I said, it depends on the view of the investor. Some people are going to say the FDA is stochastic, right? Uh, others are um, going to take the more nuanced approach of, you know, what are you going to do and what does that mean? I think as we've seen um, some of the sophisticated investors understand and we've talked about, had that, just have that conversation about here's our process and here's why this is right for the business uh, of, of the approach that we're taking, I think has always been uh, a conversation to have. You're going to lose some investors that way because some yeah. investors just want to see that stamp of approval. Uh, so we did things like get our quality system, get ISO 1345 right. and showcase, hey, we, we have all the building blocks. We know what we need to do from quality and regulatory. And, and once again, it's all about proof points. And I think being able to showcase that. Yeah, was I think what you did, which is really important, is 
you, you showed that you understood the regulatory process and you understood the risks and you did the right. stuff to mit you can never mitigate right. the regulatory risk 100%, right? FDA is always in a position to change right. or push back or ask for more data. But I think what a lot of companies do is they just, when they're in front of investors, they underestimate how difficult that process can be. Right. And when an investor hears a company pitching and it just feels, and I've heard this like so many times, it just feels like they're minimizing the regulatory risk, that's like an instant allergic right. reaction. It's sure. like, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Right? I'd much rather hear you say, look, there's significant risk here. We, we know we need a quality system. We got it. Right. We got this. Right? We know we need a good study design. Right? Statistically valid endpoints. Right? We got this. Yep. Right? Having those things in place as opposed to say, yeah, they're right. You know, FDA's, everyone knows FDA's gotten a lot sure. better, and they have. They're much more interactive in my days. You know, everything was in writing. They fell back on, you know, we'll get back in 30 days with a written response. Now it's great. FDA has come a long way. They're much more interactive. They're much more supportive sure. of startups than they used to be. I mean, there's a palpable difference. I, 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 we haven't really gotten into that, but at least with the companies I'm involved with, there's a palpable difference in the support right. and responsiveness. So I think it actually has made a lot of investors come back to the table who previously, I mean, I know investors on Sand Hill Road that would say, we're out. Until yep. the FDA gets this thing figured out, yep. we've lost too much money in regulatory hell. We're, we're out. And that, I think, is, is behind us now. But you cannot underestimate the Indeed. regulatory challenges. Indeed. And I think that's one of the other things that, that you did really well. Um, OK, next question. Uh, yeah. So we're always talking about the challenges of EHR integration, right? Almost every digital health company faces right. this, this challenge. We, uh, we, we sometimes call EHR integration you know, the wood chipper of digital health, you know, where great technologies go to die. Um, how did you, do you, are you dealing with that? I mean, it's a little different in the dialysis space. There, it's not the same EHR that the hospital uses typically. So how did you, what were your thoughts on how, how do you deal with the EHR integration? Yeah, it's actually one of the things that we, from a market assessment, uh, was important to us. Um, we realized that, once again, why we like dialysis was well, there are two big uh, groups um, in the, out there. That meant two EHRs rather than going hospital by hospital and having to be um, going to that wood chipper like you mentioned uh, was important. I think even why we looked at uh, not necessarily folks that have the, the biggest, baddest epic system that is going to take, you know, which is great and looks nice, but it's going to take forever for a startup to integrate with. Is there a way to, to push, you know, folks, initial folks into more of a portal that, that, you're, that you're controlling while you showcase that proof point, do it for a lower cost and have that EHR integration um, as it's kind of a second step. Once again, finding that, that um, I don't want to say a lower bar, but, but some, you know, hurdle the bar that you can hurdle when you're young and, and lean and don't have a lot of resources and then tackle the, uh, the stuff in the future. Because once again, if you go logo hunt, then you're stuck in you know, a 23 page you know, list of questions that you have to answer and put together for your EHR. And that might, you, know, you might just be stuck as a company taking three months doing that. And while you're doing that, your product's not getting any better. You're not getting any more clinical data and you're not, you're not being able to know what your impact is on patients, which ultimately, once again, to actually help you commercialize, your investors want to see. So I think that cycle of, can I find somebody that's willing to work with me, that's maybe willing to work with the web portal initially, mm -hmm. understanding right. that we're, where we're going to be in the future, I think there, there's, there's ways to just think about, you know, think of through all of those things that really prevent your commercialization stuff, you know. Right, I think that, that, is, that is has good. to play in your go-to-market right. strategy, right? Because you may have a customer like, oh, they're, you know, the ideal customer profile um, is an important thing to think about, right? right? When you're developing that early go-to-market plan, who are those ideal customers? And, and the EHR integration has to play into that. Because um, right. we always joke, we say, you know, see that long line down the hall? That's the line in front of the IT department. Exactly. Get on the end. Exactly. Of it. So just yep. because you get past that, you know, twelve month, eighteen month business unit, you know, all the, a lot of these right. folks. Everything that you seems aligned, right. right? Everyone's aligned, but they've got a hundred companies coming to them, and then on top of that, a hundred companies that came before you, like you said, are now stuck in the the IT roadmap, and you're stuck with. I think this works. Find you know, there's got to be a better way to do it. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, next question from Kay Lee. Uh, what's the commercially, commercialization timeline for your technology? Yeah, so uh, about this time next year, I'll uh, look to, to be on market um, with, with the product. Like, uh, 
So I think we touched on this, but um, I'll actually segue it. So the question from uh, Jamie Correa is, what kind of strategies do you use to do clinical validation with the providers? We touched on that a little bit, but I think you can drill down. And, but I think, and do you offer free pilots? And I think the pilot discussion is a really interesting yeah, it's one. Yes, it's a really interesting one. So um, I think, you know, we, we talk about pilot purgatory. You know, there's a lot of questions around that. I think, once again, we really found really highly aligned folks. We were willing to, to make our uh, patches and hubs, uh, et cetera, uh, available. Uh, to them at, at, at our cost. But then we also had an ask. We said, this isn't just about, we're gonna give you patches and hubs and you go play with it and that's it. Here's a, a very clear phase strategy. Phase one, we're gonna do this on an acute setting so everybody gets a chance to learn. Phase two, we're gonna do this in um, a, a, a longer term setting so we get, once again, that second phase of clinical validation that we want that fits in and that also fits in with what you need. And we start to do the integration, we start to do the full clinical workflow. We understand that in phase one, then we start to build it for you in phase two, kind of as a, as a, in as a customer. And then that phase three, post-regulatory, we really want you to be involved in our post-market registry, and that is gonna help us commercially. You use the product with a lot of patients, plus you can then help us grow that product out there. So I don't think I look at it as a free pilot, here's my stuff, go use it. It's, are you on a journey with me that is going to be mutually beneficial, that helps us both out, that we have shared values, that you have milestones that you have to meet as a partner, I have milestones I have to meet as your partner, and how do we do that together, I think is really, really key. Not just, I have somebody who's excited and I'm gonna ship them product. Right, you're so I think excited, is, and when you're right, a startup, right, you, right, like, you think, oh, oh man, they the want head it. of cardiology, right. or the head of vascular is excited right. about this. Oh, is it a big name center? I, we gotta run over there. It's sort right. of almost a shiny object syndrome, exactly. right? You're, you've, you've got credibility. And then you're like, oh, well, the business, like you said, the business unit doesn't care. The, the, the office of innovation at the hospital doesn't care. The IT department is like, we're not gonna pull this in. Whereas if you actually go to that business unit leader and have that conversation, yes, it's, it's a few more, you know, it's a few more weeks, six to eight weeks more up front. Right. But if you think about that and you, and you walk through that with folks, um, it's good. I think also don't be afraid to have a template. I think, you know, it's always hard to, it's kind of like, I think we talked about, it's kind of like getting a lead investor, getting a lead clinical site, but having one that gives you a template that you really like, we then were able to then take that to others and say, here's what we have. Here's what the data rights look like. Here's what the, uh, right. the publication rights look like. Here's what, what's built in. Are you willing to, to work with this too? We're not being crazy. We're not being a, right. we're we not know a startup. It's fair and it's but market. But this is fair and this is what, what's out there and other people have accepted. It makes things so much quicker because then it's just a, everybody understands where you're coming from and, and what your uh, thought process is. Right, but your point of put in the extra time up right. front, it's going to save you a whole lot of time mm -hmm. on the back, I right. think, is really important. Uh, and then the second part of Jamie's question, which I guess is with what you said in mind, sure. do you do the pilots for free or do you think you should charge for them? So I think, I think once again, the question for us is as a regulated product, we, we can't, right? right? You're yeah. in a different spot. So we, we, we asked a little bit more of, yet, okay, so. the way, if you will, are you willing to put skin in the game though is the way we looked at it as a regulated right, product, that's a, which was, are you willing to offset the cost? I mean, we went to folks that, that were out there that want to use it. These are, like I said, one and a half million dollar studies. And instead we said, okay, are you willing to offset your internal costs, the cost of your nursing staff, your clinicians, because you're excited and because it's meaningful to you? And Sarah wants to know, we talked about the four Ps, I guess a little bit more distinction. Why are you drawing a distinction between the provider and the physician? Oh, absolutely. So I think that's one that, uh, you know, once again, that kind of the customer, I think it really boils down to the customer and the user. Your physician's your user, they're, they're, or they're the, the person that's actually um, maybe is involved, especially in episodic care with, with the product, or maybe getting that data. They're kind of consuming that data, but they're not the one paying for it. Uh, the, the provider, i.e. your health system, is often the one that is making the purchasing decision. Um, that might be even made at a level above that if they have a group purchasing uh, scheme. I think even, you, you kind of saw that with devices. I'm sure at some point that's going to happen in the wearables and, and market as well as people want that consolidation. It's gonna go to that GPO level as well. So that's where I would say that provider of who's actually making the decision to use something is still different from who's actually at the end of the day paying for it, right? And so trying to figure out is your provider actually paying for it because they're seeing cost savings or new revenue, or are they paying for it because they can bill and get reimbursed from it from a payer? I think those are really, they're, they're very uh, you know, narrow distinctions, but ones that are really, really important to figure out early on. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's even another level beyond, so the four Ps, which is a really good way to characterize it, but even physicians is almost a little too monolithic because it might not be the physician. It might be an advanced care provider, right? right? It could be a nurse practitioner, be a physician assistant. Right. And they may view like their workflows right. and the way they interact with your platform may be different than even the way the physician right. looks at it. I think it's all about the clinical workflow. Something that we really talked a lot about was, you know, we talked about being an NM platform of the patch, the hub, the cloud, uh, and then the, the, the portal for data. And I think the thing is the electrons in the middle all work just fine. It's the people at either end which break. Right? And understanding that, that you don't want to disrupt the patient workflow. It's why we made our wearable you know, shower proof, sweat proof. You can basically do everything but swim the English Channel. On the other side of that, for the, the clinician, we understood why we did clinically actionable parameters that are alert based is that I have not, as of yet, met a clinician that wants more data. Right? I mean, right. we talk a lot about, we, we call them facts internally, but it's a FAQQ and it's qu quantity, quality, frequency, and accountability. What does that actually mean in terms of your data? Uh, and I think having alerts that, that let them know I got to do something is so much better than just, here's a report on how your patient's doing. No one's got but time for that. those alerts have to be accurate. Yeah, have to be right? accurate. Because be alert accurate. fatigue is a real problem. It is. So it more is. dings on my cell phone right. telling me more stuff I need to do right. does not make my life you, any yeah, better. Yeah, that, that, that uh, false positive, false negative question is one that you really have to, you know, really have to figure out and figure out what you market wants. And what are they willing to accept and what are they, you know, what are they willing to do? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really important part of the analysis when you're, because if you're turning one dial, if you're turning up the sensitivity, then you're probably turning down the specificity, right? right. So you really do have to figure have out to what figure the commercial out, right? accept cutoffs are uh, for those things. Um, someone, uh, Alfred asked about your regulatory path. I think we touched on that. You're 510K, right, 510K with clinical data. We uh, Actually, it's with bench data, but we actually do already have clinical data, and so you requ it does require a usability study. A big thing for wearables is, adhesive, so find a 10993 compliant adhesive. Uh, and then I think one thing that people maybe just early on don't think about, we talked about regulatory, I'll, I'll talk about is uh, make sure a lot of them require 60, uh, IEC 60601 testing as an active, wear, you know, active you know, electronic product, if you will. So make sure that's built in, um, that testing is not cheap. It sometimes requires certain environments and might take time. So to your point about talk about all the, the risks that are out there, have a plan for it already, show how that fits into your timeline, I think is important. You don't wanna get clearance and then go, oh, before I can actually commercialize, I now need six months of 60601 testing or whatever it is, is a, is a bad surprise to have for anyone. Absolutely, and as I understand it, that testing has to be done on your finished or what can right. be represented exactly. as a finished right. product, right? right? So in the old days, when I was uh, starting out, we could, we could say, well, this is equivalent Right? This right. is the manufacturing equivalent of right. what we're going to build later. Right. You don't get away with that nope. anymore, right? Nope. So you actually have to have effectively finished product exactly. to do all that testing on, exactly. right? And exactly. that, obviously, now you actually have to build them to the spec. Right. And that's where I think like you said, getting a manufacturing partner in early, understanding yeah, who great. that is. I mean, that's why we went and got ISO 1345 early was so that we could build everything in-house and we control that entire process. And that really uh, sped up the turnaround time of if we needed a slightly different sensor or something else, we could just do it in-house. We built our own boards. We did a lot of that work uh, in-house. Was really, uh, we weren't waiting for something in Flextronics' queue. Um, they do, I'm sure they do amazing work. We weren't waiting for a you know, supplier and stuck you know, for yeah. three or four months to really do that, to, to really hit that. We were able to, to tweak very quickly yep. on the fly. Um, so Steve Meyer has a question. What are your thoughts on shared risk revenue model? He, his question is for a pilot, but I think I would expand that even beyond the pilot. Like have you, we didn't really get into pricing today, but I think the whole area of shared risk pricing is a really fascinating one. It would seem like yours would lend itself to that type of a model. What are your thoughts on that? So I think the question around that is, are you managing the patient or are you, are you managing a service? Um, I think you're, we're seeing a lot of shared risks coming into, uh, I think, someone in the nephrology space, like, like someone like a Strive Health or something like that, that is trying to manage the entire uh, kidney disease, you know, end stage renal disease patient from all their different right. areas or a cricket that's trying to get that chronic kidney disease before they get up to, to end stage. Uh, I think they, 
might lend themselves more to that shared risk model because they are touching the entire continuum of care. Right. They, have they have control, much more control. And they're making the decision. They have doctors in place. Uh, I think you're managing a service more like we are, which is we're managing we're managing the patient, but we're managing the service right now, right? Uh, I think that is maybe more to a subscription model or a chronic right. care model. Um, and, and being able to understand what that means uh, is important. But I think it's going to be harder for, um, I'll say, data providers and data aggregators yeah, and, and hardware as a service providers to get into shared risk as much as maybe it is for someone who's managing the whole patient. Because then a payer knows, I'm paying you X dollars. You manage the patient, and you're on the hook. If, if your model breaks, as opposed to just because, you know, somebody doesn't pay attention to the alert and they don't do their job. Right. You're penalized. You're, you're penalized. Right. And, and people don't want you to. You don't control, like, you don't right. control the risk per se. Right. right? You're providing data which right. should provide better, more cost-effective right. care, but you, you don't control the last mile. Right. And the last where, mile is, I think, where that shared risk really comes into place. If you control that or you're part of that, then you're involved. Yep. Um, your strategy, uh, Steve had another question. Steve Myers had another question. Um, how do you, uh, what's your strategy for distinguishing your ecosystem uh, for investors regarding your intellectual property? Yeah, so I think in, in, it's just a term of how we kind of built IP and how we think about IP. Is, is that kind of I question? I think the question is, yeah, you know, what everyone, wearables are, are almost ubiquitous now. I mean, you mentioned when we spoke before, they're almost like a, becoming a commodity. Yeah. So where is, is your IP on the wearable? Where's your IP? What's your IP strategy? Yeah, so I think uh, we, we looked at IP as kind of three modes, a three mode strategy. The first mode is always the hardware. The second mode is how we get data from point A to point B. Those we patent, we patent hard. We've got about, uh, I think, 27 patent families that are currently um, under prosecution uh, that we're going through. We've got about seven issued patents already. Um, and then the last moat is the, uh, the actual algorithms for how do we take raw data and turn that into, into something meaningful. Um, I think the way we looked at it is kind of like a recipe, like we'll give you the ingredient list, but we're not gonna give you the secret sauce on how we bake the cookies is kind of how we took, took an approach. Uh, on top of that, um, from an algorithmic standpoint, we did something intentional, is we did raw data. So it's all, we don't do any onboard processing. So that means we really want this to be stealable. And I think this came from our customers who kind of said, hey, I might have patients who are gonna put this on eBay. What do, we, what do we all do at that point? So we said, okay, make it stealable, great. You can put it out there. There's no patient data on it. There's, there's nothing ever um, that's compromising. So even if somebody does it, there's nothing there. Uh, so even if it, you know, I think our security team does a pretty <coughs> good job, but if it does get hacked, okay. There's no patient data. So that was intentional. So it's only raw data. It's all off the shelf sensors and components. So good, someone's gonna peel this apart and look at all of them. Uh, but then that automatically gets uploaded to the hub. Once again, in the hub, there's nothing. The reason we did cellular was for a security and privacy standpoint, uh, but then also allowed us to, once again, get raw data to the cloud and it's, it's, it's hackable. So you're not gonna see anything. Um, so once it's in the cloud, that's when we do all the, the legwork, if you will, of putting things together. And that was also built into our pipeline for the future was we wanted raw data so we could always go back, look at our patients longitudinally, derive more exciting metrics along the way. Got it. <coughs> um, gosh, I can't believe we're almost out of time here. There's so many great questions here. It's been awesome that everyone's been putting up all these, uh, all these questions. All right, we've got... Yeah, we're, we've got, I'm good. Got we got, we've got time, so great. we can keep going. Great. Okay. Uh, you know, I think we may have just skipped over inadvertently. What parameters do you actually collect? Yeah, so um, I kinda, I'll, I'll talk about it kind of from a patient perspective and a dialysis perspective. And by the way, thanks for the question, Matt. <laughs> sure. So uh, first we look at, I mentioned access health. So you've got a, that conduit. You're looking for that conduit that it, it may actually fail. The way clinicians monitor that today is uh, typically with a, like a Doppler and ultrasound. And they look at it in terms of what's called mils per minute, so the volumetric flow. So that's one of the things that we get is volumetric flow. Uh, along with that, we also can, with just one patch, here we can actually map an entire extremity for a blockage of a vessel, of any vessel all the way kind of from the axillary artery back to the central vein, uh, we can actually map the level of blockage. So that's around the access, and that's really kind of what gives you that uh, uh, faith that we can then go to peripheral arterial disease because we can do the same thing by putting this on the, the, the back of the leg for mm -hmm. a patient. If we think about fluid management, we start out with some of the basics. Heart rate, SpO2, the pulse waveform, heart rate variability. We then have built onto that with highly accurate hemoglobin and hematocrit. 
Uh, and then now we have uh, some good understanding around blood pressure as well. And then uh, we've started to build into more of the, the pulse waveform and how are these patients doing from a rhythm standpoint uh, by adding an ECG uh, into the newest patch as well. And that's starting to get us into more of the arrhythmia and analyte detection, such as hyperhypokalemia. And we're looking to do things like urea and sodium as well, which are a lot of the, the pieces that matter to these patients. And underlying all of that, I'll say real quick, is kind of five, 15 sensors in five different groups of optical, acoustic, thermal, mechanical, and then ECG uh, as well, all contained into one sensor, one, one platform. So that's a lot of tech. I mean, there, that wasn't an easy, it was not no, easy to no, figure no, out no, how to get not. all those clinic, validate the accuracy of right. all those and do right. it in something that was reasonably cost Indeed. effective. Um, yes, and that, that's important. Being cost effective is important. Uh, figuring out how to you really maximize uh, battery life. If we're not using the ECG, we can get all, almost up to 90 days worth of battery life. So things like that that are, once again, keep your COGS low, allow you to get that subscription level uh, pricing point that, that meets what your customers need is, is tough. And then part B on Matt's question, um, self-reported data, and I, maybe I'll just expand it. How do, how do you, do you collect, do you integrate with other data collection modalities um, you know, which would, you know, if I'm trying to do heart failure, I want, I want some other parameters. I want maybe the patient's weight, which I assume you're not able to get uh, from that. So how do you integrate with other parameters? Uh, yeah, so I think um, one of the, the questions that we had was we, the way we kind of designed the product is we, we interviewed 500 patients, and then we actually went and spent uh, a week embedded with about a dozen of them living their lives, if you will, going to the centers, getting dialysis, going home, and then with their vascular access nurses and with a nephrologist, understanding that continuum of care, making sure it didn't interfere with anybody. Uh, along the way, one of the, the big questions was, okay, if the patients have an app that's getting all this data, do they start calling me all the time? So that was, uh, you know, we realized that was gonna be maybe an initial barrier to entry from the clinician side. So we haven't done a patient focused app or patient sided app. We also realized that that was probably one of the lower hanging fruit that we could we could tackle later or that people already like MyM Health and others, right. some of our Somebody partners, companies that we've that. already yeah. uh, know pretty well have built out there. So why, why you know, rebuild that wheel on our own? Let's just kind of right. see how the market develops. And so there, there's some feedback via the hub right now, kind of change your patch, things are working, things are okay, or call your doc. We kind of just have that via the hub, via kind of icon, lighted icons, if you will. Um, but then we will eventually build into that. And obviously for things like you mentioned, like heart failure and others, we do want more interaction uh, from the patient. But getting that trust, I think, from the hospital and the clinician is key first. So, uh, uh, Moni, I hope I'm saying that right, or Moni, uh, is sort of raising the question that sales cycles are very long. Um, have you thought about how much capital you're going to need to sustain you through the commercialization process? I mean, we always tell if you're selling, you're, I mean, I think your go-to-market is smart. We talk, you're not doing the big logo hunting initially. Um, but for companies that are selling to large enterprise healthcare systems, you know, we say it's, tw it's a 12 to 24 month sales cycle. Yep. Um, you know, when you think about your capital requirements and, hey, you're going to be commercializing in a year or so. Um, you know, how have you thought through, one, have you thought about that sales cycle? And two, have you thought about, are there any hacks? We're always looking for ways, everyone is looking for ways to shorten that sales cycle. Yeah, so I think uh, on one end, a lot of people, I think, kind of look at revenue or as, some, as a goal. And I think what we did is we always did a clash flow break even. Because I think that forces you to think about your cost and your sales cycle and, and the time that it takes it to actually book that revenue, if you will. Uh, as part of that process. We, that's always kind of been more of an interesting um, timeline or, or, or framework uh, for us, and I think which has sorry, uh, driven a lot of the, uh, the decision process that we've had. And I think that's where we then kind of, once again, worked our way backwards to what's the sales cycle required then to, to be able to hit that. Uh, I kind of mentioned a little around the clinical work. Once again, that phase strategy, we went out and we said, okay, what are the number of patients that we need to hit cash flow break even while entertaining these long sales cycles? And how do we shorten that was with the clinical work as well of phasing out that strategy which said, here's phase one, here's phase two, and then phase three is once we're post clearance, you're, you're locked in, you're working with us, you're, you're going to be, a, you know, we want you to be a customer and, and, and be part of that process. You have an out, but that's, you know, which I think you have to do kind of be right, right. pre, pre clearance uh, as, as a company, um, but being able to, to pull them in. And something that we did is we said, okay, our partners represent, you know, for us, our cash flow break even point was about 20,000 patients. Our 
you know, if we look at the market that we're attacking is about a million patients, the initial couple, couple countries that we're looking at is a total of about a million patients. We already have 75,000 kind of built into the, uh, the clinical work that we're doing today. So to hit that 20,000 means if you can hit a third of the patients, your populations that you're already working with, you can get there. So that's kind of how we thought about the hack, if you will, to how do we, how do, we do that um, and how do we get there and how do we, we stay lean enough to, to make that happen? And, and the goal is to have this, uh, this next financing be able to get us the whole way uh, through. It might be split into two, two tranches, but the idea is to have it uh, to get sense. us the whole way there. Um, so Wei Lin wants to know, does your MD degree help you pitch? Does it help you pitch doctors, investors? Um, you know, have, has that been a point? A uh, I think it's, it's all about, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about knowing your customer. I think so that's beneficial, um, you know, being able to have that conversation with the doc. I think uh, our, our best hack was uh, when we first uh, sent out emails uh, to all of our SAB members, we kind of listed, okay, what are the top vascular surgery interventional radiology uh, conferences? And we wanted to get the, the kind of leading names and leading lights. We were maybe a little bit of logo hunting at that point, but we wanted to build an SAB that could help us decide. And I realized that uh, doing a lot of surgical residencies, that there's this little bit of time between when a clinician gets in and when they start their OR day, that they all sit at a computer and check their email because they're waiting for the OR day to start. And that's when we sent all of our emails to be the number one email at the top of their list. And we got everybody that we, uh, we talked to, which was, I, I think that's the only hack that I can really say was uh, useful from going to four years of med school. <laughs> okay, it's a lot of no, time. There, there, there's, cool for just no, there, there, there's a lot. Of, I think there's some value, but I, I actually think you really have to, at the end of the day, it, it maybe gets you through that seed stage, but you have to know your customer. You have to understand the financial side of what you're doing, the sales cycle. It, it turns into the business. How do you build a business? Less so, how do I get a couple docs excited to, to talk to me? But you have that, I mean, you because of the medical background, you grew up in a medical family, right? being able to talk the talk with a clinician, right? Which is something even if you're not a clinician or you don't have an MD degree, MD degree you better be able to do, right? If right, I'm the CEO yeah. of a startup, I better hit the books, right. right? I mean, I remember when I first got into the vascular access business, just reading textbooks on vascular access, sure. right? Yep. Going to grand rounds, yep. right? Educating yourself Absolutely. so that you can become a clinical right. expert, even if you don't have any formal Right. clinical training, right? Indeed. Because you stand up in front of a, you know, an expert, subject right. matter expert in vascular access or end stage renal disease, and, and you don't know your stuff. Clinic, you may be the, an aces on the business side, the fundraising side, but you, you have to have that knowledge and that credibility Absolutely. when it you're, helps. When you're helps. in front of uh, you know, potential customers, clinicians. Okay, I think we're getting close to wrapping up here. Uh, maybe one more question from Kanye Priya. Um, we sort of did talk about pilots. We, we've hit on that. The question is, how many are good enough and of what duration? I think you've laid out the fact that you have a very structured process with a defined endpoint. I will say, just to expound on that a tiny bit, I think uh, actually uh, uh, we do ourselves a disservice in, you know, in the health tech world by even calling them pilots. Like that, that's a bad <laughs> name. To me, that should be a yeah. four-letter word. That should be the, the word that shall not be spoken, right? I think it's much you know, better, better to refer to these you know, as a trial to commercialize or yep. a trial to purchase, really. Indeed. It should be called a trial to purchase, yep. right? Because this is a pilot just sounds like, hey, let's help me test this thing and see if it works, like a test pilot. Get in the plane. Let's try this. Oh, man, I hope that plane doesn't crash. Thank right. you. It, no, that's really not what this is. So we always tell dream of companies, you know, don't, don't think of it as a pilot. This, this is right. just part of your process to get a, to close a deal, right? Indeed. I, I think, you know, it's actually interesting. The NHS calls it a service evaluation. Uh, and I think that's kind of an interesting way to, to look at it. Is, is this product in service going to be what I expect it to be? Uh, and which I think is, a, is an interesting way to look at it. I think the last... You know, from, a, from that standpoint, I think, think about your commercial goals. You know, like I mentioned for us, we thought about, okay, who do we need to work with to hit kind of a, a certain number of patients that we can potentially work with and what are those incentives? But I think there was also a clinical and R&D goal as well, which is each partner was specifically brought in because of their clinical or R&D interests, which helps us on our pipeline. So if you're always gonna have an iteration to your device or something that you want next. You don't wanna be stuck with, here are my first four folks, just because they said yes, well, you know, the real values on that second iteration of your product, we all know that, when are you doing that study? You don't wanna have those four all get excited and then they're all waiting for you know, version number two and you have no data to back it up, nowhere to showcase that it worked. 
think about layer that into your thinking, I think is important because that's something that we, we did in terms of the NHS helps us commercialize, but also helps us with a specific R&D goal, but then also helps us showcase in a single payer system, you know, where is the value? All of those were contained in there. Another partner was the only integrated nephrology and heart failure group in the country. Since we knew we wanted to go to heart failure, these patient populations are together, that's really meaningful. Another group was highly focused on blood pressure, for example, and it was, okay, this group already has all the validation, you know, not just the gold standard, but all the other validation techniques that people are at, that keep asking me about on a competitive analysis on right. investors. That we're working with that group that is putting us up against all of those. It's done, it's, or it's gonna happen in three months. That's a lot better question than, I hope I find that at some point. And so being able to, to corral uh, all of that in, it means you're gonna have to say no to folks and it, you know, it might mean that your investors right. are kind of saying, what are you doing, why aren't you getting more? But you're saying, no, here's my very um, strategic process to getting to the yeah, next step. Yeah, I think that it's being very methodical and strategic as opposed to, oh, I've got this key opinion later, seems really excited, is at a big medical center, right. has published a lot in the space, how right. can I not want to work with that person? Right. right? But we've already covered this ground. Yeah. I think it it's really is being strategic in how you think about those, those partnerships and those relationships. So we're over time here, but this has been a really fun oh, conversation. Lots of great insights from you, David. Can't, can't thank you enough for doing this. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, again, sorry we got the late start today, but thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you like this, please go to dreamit.com slash live. Um, you can see previous uh, LinkedIn Lives that we've done. We'd also appreciate suggestions on topics that, that we might do in the future. Also encourage you to go and subscribe to our YouTube page. Lots of additional content there as well, including Dream It Doses, which are uh, quick, less than five minute uh, topics that are relevant uh, to startups. Hope that you'll, you'll consider applying to the Dream It Spring 2020 program if you're a, a health tech startup. Uh, we are actively recruiting for the Spring 2020 cohort right now. Uh, and if you want to know more, uh, go to our website. You can actually see videos there that will provide a lot, give you really an insider's look uh, as to the different pillars of, of the Dream It program. Uh, and finally, we do have another upcoming Dream It Live come this Thursday, as a matter of fact, October 10th. Uh, my partner, Steve Barsh, will be doing a LinkedIn Live with Kaya Kayaso from Slidebean. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see you at the next LinkedIn Live.